Okay, Dr. Amber Tishner, welcome to Power Presence Position. Well, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. This conversation has been a long time in the making. I can remember when I first heard about your work on female rivalry at work, um, and I thought it was so compelling. So much has happened since then. You've published a book, which we'll get into it in a moment, (laughs) but really exciting. So take us back. Where does this notion of female rivalry, like I think so many of us have experienced it at work. Um, There's certainly a culture of it. I know I was taught to expect it. I was totally taught to expect it. Which is sad. My gosh. Yes. It's true. So sad. (laughs) So sad. It's the culture, you know. But um, where does the notion of female rivalry come from? What are its origins? Take us back to what the origins of female rivalry are. Where do you think it comes from? There are so many faucets to it. It's, it's of course, the individual. Um, It's society. It's how women, um, it's the the concept of gender, how females and males have been raised differently. It's um, aggression and um, social intelligence. You know, um, at, at a certain age, boys and girls will have the same types of social intelligence, but girls at probably eight or nine, seven or eight, they will develop social intelligence sooner than little boys will. And so boys still have like an overt physical aggression, whereas girls start using their mind and that's when it becomes indirect aggression. So it is so many different things. It can be the way you're raised. It can be, you know, what you see in other females who are in your life. And so you think that behavior is acceptable. There are tons a faucets to it. And when I went and initially did my research, I had to have a grounding theory. So I went back to the theories of aggression as a baseline just for gender differences. Got it. And so, and that's where you discovered that at a young age, and we're being binary here, we get it. Yes, uh, yes, we're yes. getting just putting that out there. Yeah. But um, that bo- at a young age, boys and girls express aggression differently. Like that starts to diverge at around the age of seven or eight when girls develop this higher social intelligence. Yes. And, you know, I've had a lot of um, people ask me, well, how does this relate to men and women or, you know, male, female relationships? I think it exists across the board to a degree, but I have only really studied the female to female. So I can't answer specifically about other, but I do know there are definitely behaviors there. I mean, we've seen it with Me Too and different things in the workplace for sure, but um, yes, I'm not excluding other gender or anything like that, but. Yeah. So what was your earliest experience of female rivalry at work? at work. So it was little tidbits of exclusion. It wasn't per se a a flat full on out rivalry, but it was, you know, coming. I remember I worked at a a well-known public sector firm in Washington, DC. I was on a powerhouse consulting team with all women. We worked for a group of all fierce women and there were a lot of strong personalities, but my first couple of months on that particular project, I was not included. And I remember I'd come home and my husband and I would walk and I'm like, I've never felt this way. Like why I'm always social. I have friends and it just felt so strange. But at that point in time, that was right before I was diving into my research. I didn't think of it as a female rivalry. It goes back to the different faucets of it, but it is an exclusion. And so it took me, it's like I had to gain trust to get into their group to be accepted. Then fast forward several months into the picture, I'm, um, you know, friends with all of them and it's great, but I totally remember that feeling. It just sucked. We sat in a U-shaped circle with all of our backs to us and they all planned a happy hour one time while I was sitting there and totally didn't invite me. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay, so, that, that, that stings. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So did that kind of pique the interest in this field of study? Like, where did you decide, yes. look, I'm going to, I need, there's something going on here that I want to study and, and pursue further. So it was that same project it's with, you know, we're in a project with all these strong women and, um, I saw it, then I really saw it occurring. And, um, 
I call it the elephant in the boardroom. And so it, um, it was happening. It was not talked about. And that just shocked the heck out of me because I'm like, what is going on here? Because then people are tiptoeing. They're walking on eggshells and um, it, uh, walking on eggshells, it's not talked about. It disrupts the culture. And then as a result, the culture is being endorsed by the behavior. So that looks like it's acceptable. And then mm -hmm. there's the, the component of psychological safety because if women can't be vulnerable to be themselves, then they will begin to shut down. And then they're working at half capacity and or not contributing. And so good women would leave and the organizations had no clue as to why these women are walking. And so that's what truly piqued my interest with the research. I, I did a qualitative study on it and I extensively interviewed nine women specifically in the working environment. And some of the stories that they shared like were mind blowing. Like, mm. I'm like, this is huge. Like, why don't we talk about this? It's not this cat fight or women being dramatic. It's, and I can't diagnose PTSD, but these women having experienced this behavior, it greatly changed the way they wanted to interact with other women. They said they never work for other females again, never be on all women teams again. It changed how they had girlfriend friendships. I mean, it's mind blowing. And, you know, to me, what's so tragic about it is that it reinforces this, you know, what feminist thinkers would call like the core feminine wound, you know, the yes. core wound yes. of patriarchy, which is that women are less than, um, yeah. they're kind of off, off, off center of importance. Yeah. And yeah. so your entire life becomes a little bit of an apology. Yes. And, and with this, and because when it's occurring, you know, and then, you know, you're fighting for room at the top in certain organizations or places, just because that's the way it's predominantly been. But when you're in it, because it's so indirect and so passive aggressive, um, you question yourself first, because you'll think, well, she, she, she didn't just do that to me. Eleanor wouldn't treat me like that. Um, well, no, I must have imagined it because I've never done anything to her to cause this behavior. So you'll start to doubt, second guess yourself. And if the woman is very good at projecting the behavior, chances are it's never occurring in front of other people. It's usually a hidden type of behavior, at least in the beginning. And so you doubt yourself and you, you start to slowly lose your confidence. Mm, yeah. And so that sort of social intelligence that we have that is so constructive and powerful in, in so many ways is kind of weaponized against ourselves and each other. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And then the way that the, the subtle teardown can occur very passively, but it can have just huge ramifications about how, you know, you feel about yourself and the behaviors you do. And in a working environment, if that's your paycheck that's affected, especially if this woman is control, has control over you in a leadership capacity or, you know, your um, assessments. So it's, it's a fine line to walk. Mm. So let's talk about, let's sort of turn the lens to women entrepreneurs and yes. how female rivalry. So I want to really explore how female rivalry can show up and manifest yes. um, for us and the kind of impact that it has. So let's kind of brainstorm because sometimes I think yeah. people can hear this and there's a couple things like it's so in, in our sort of culture of what I'm going to describe as toxic positivity, Yes. It can be so <laughs> damning and shameful for a woman to admit that she has been, that she has done these things, Yes, but I'm not sure that any woman hasn't yes. <laughs> like, no, you have to be, you know what I mean? So I just want to put that out there. If you're feeling kind of like, Ooh, I'm feeling uncomfortable. Yeah. I think whether you're doing it directly or indirectly, chances are we've all done it to a degree at some point or another. Yeah. And yeah, I think it, there's no shame in talking about that because that's yeah. how you evolve and grow. Um, but it's interesting. I, I would love more stories from the other woman. And it's very hard to get that information because yeah. there's shame. There's a lot of shame yeah, yeah. involved and, and it's both sides. But then in my book, I, um, I do have a couple of stories of um, individuals that came back and actually one wrote a letter 
and greatly after she kicked this lady out of the working environment, like she literally pushed her out of the organization they were working in. And then about a year later, wrote her a letter and would very totally apologized for her behavior and how much shame she felt and how she treated her. Mm -hmm. And that's rare. Well, Right. And I think it's yeah. because, you know, it's, it's this larger sort of cultural soup and there's so many different things like this idea yeah. that it, you know, it can be based on this idea that there's so little room on the table, like at, yes. at the table. So yes. you need to fight for the spots that you have, you know, yes. there's also yeah. this other thing that I see. And I remember kind of growing up with this, um, and it was sort of, you know, bred into the culture that, women will be jealous that there's, they're going to be jealous of you and they're going to, um, and that's going to impact the opportunities that they'll, yeah. that they'll give to you. And I don't know, this was probably baseless, but it was really coming through. And I can remember that. So I remember going into the workforce, anticipating this, which yeah. I bet there are people listening who have experienced that too, you know, probably yeah. not all, but some, and it, it, it can be so, so the relationship with other women allies for some women is a little bit tainted from the very beginning, right? Because you're taught to be on guard. And um, in our society, because of, we'll say less room at the top, healthy competition has been off limits. It's not, you know, women are taught to sit still, be pretty, don't rock the boat, you know, um, make yourself feel small so that others feel big. And so, um, there's so many things that feed into it. Um, and it's hard to break that mold if that's what society endorses. And then mm. society, you know, the cat fight or the women being dramatic and it's taught to be made fun of. I mean, you look at some of the reality shows and The Bachelor starts out sometimes with a cat noise, you know, like, I yeah. mean, if that's not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. And, and the thing is too, right? Like uh, a, a sane, <laughs> rational thinking woman who has, you know, she's done her personal work. She's yeah. read Brene Brown. She listens yeah. to personal development. She shares the quote cards. It's really easy to think, oh, The Bachelor, whatever. That doesn't impact me. But, you know, one of the things that I'm seeing is the depth to which, you know, a patriarchal culture absolutely yeah. impacts women and how we think, oh, even huge. smart women. <laughs> It, it does because, and often with women, it's, um, and again, I haven't studied this in men, but women mm -hmm. see their own identity through the lens of how they view other women, your oh. mothers, your sisters, your colleagues, we're always comparing our own identity through what we see others doing. And so if, you know, the downfall of another woman society kind of endorses that okay that makes you feel good about yourself and so then it's okay the younger woman you know gets the the husband or you know somebody gains weight and you're taught well I look better than her you know these little subtleties but these downfalls also are teaching us that then if, as we strive for power it's shameful to want power yeah if that so makes this is so sense. fascinating. Yeah. Totally. Mm -hmm. This is so fascinating. So this idea that women, how we see ourselves is shaped by how we see other women. And that's kind of the root of comparisonitis. Yes. That's, that's fascinating to me. Because it's hard to, it's hard to separate yourself. And then you look at the women that do, let's say Hil Hillary Clinton, you know, she's a strong, mm -hmm. powerful woman, but then she was called a bitch or this or that for speaking her mind and having a voice. So if you're rocking the boat, it's going back to, you know, kind of not rocking the boat. If you're rocking the boat, you're standing out, then you're loud, then you're too much. And so um, it's mm -hmm. easy to point and, you know, yeah, compete or blame. Right. So let's yeah. talk about, let's talk about how this shows up for female founders and yeah. in, based on your experience, you know, in seeing women entrepreneurs in particular, yeah. what are some very sort of practical ways in which female rivalry might be showing up? And of course, it's not always that you're head to head competing with someone. It's often coming up in a much more subtle ways. How have you seen it show itself? Well, it's funny because let's say you're a coach and I'm a coach 
Mm -hmm. Chances are just because of, and maybe we're coaching on exactly the same thing, but our mm -hmm. personalities are different. The, what we bring to the table is different. Our experience is different. Our education is different because of all those different nuances. We are going to come about how we do our business 100% differently. But I think that's a very hard concept for women to wrap their arms around because automatically, if you're a coach, well, then you're my competition. And mm -hmm. I look at that very differently. I think, well, why couldn't we bond together? Sure, we may be doing similar things. We could even have some similar types of clients, but if I have somebody that doesn't sync well, or maybe my books are full, Eleanor may be the best person to, that I can refer them to. Um, so there's that kind of scarcity feeling that I think women get. And I've seen that whether it's, it's, I've had some fascinating stories that if women feel they're being pushed out, the claws come out. And so mm -hmm. that's one way to look at it in, um, it's just more of a scarcity mindset. And I, I just don't think that's a true mindset or yeah. we flip it. And I think a lot of it, I talk a lot about the she bully, which is, you know, that your little voice in the back of your head. So I call it your inner she bully. And some of it, I'm a firm believer that you have to love yourself in order to love other women. Because if that little voice is constantly telling you that you're not good enough, she's equally going to be saying the same thing about other women. So if you look at confident women that have you know, great circles or tribes, chances are they are really confident in their own skin. And so I think that also plays a huge part in, you know, this type of competition or rivalry that can come out between women. Mm. And that's interesting because I think, you know, so this idea of scarcity and how scarcity mm -hmm. can really shut it can shut down collaboration. Yes. It can shut down your ability to lead. Yes. It can um, make you feel that people might be taking things from you. Yeah. And it's interesting because I have sort of done research into this idea of like the feminine, feminine creative power, essentially. Yes. And one of the core signs that your that your feminine creativity that maybe it's shut down a little bit. It's not as healthy that maybe it, it requires some time and attention and that kind of thing mm -hmm. is the fear of other people taking from you. Yes. You know? And so I always thought, you know, that's, that's so powerful. And so to a degree, female rivalry can impact a woman entrepreneur, whether she is in quote unquote, direct competition with someone or not, there may not even need to be another woman in the picture for her to feel sure. and experience and be shut down by female rivalry. 100%. And so it's this mindset of women saving, savoring defeats of other women that we lose out on our true allies. And that's mm -hmm. sad. Um, because if we join together, that's who our sisterhood is. There's a flip side though, because I was, I was thinking about this from an entrepreneurial lens, you know, with women. Um, I've had a lot of women tell me that because they won't work for another woman or be on female teams, that this was maybe their segue to start their own business because they were done with the crazy BS and they weren't going to do it anymore. So I've had many women say, well, that's what kickstarted me into doing my own thing. And so I'm like, <laughs> Well, good for you. Yeah. I mean, yes. As long you as you don't, don't want, stay like, there. Yeah, exactly. You have to, you take what you went through, you learn from it, you move forward. Yeah. Yeah. So I have, I've personally found that, you know, this, this, um, in my work, you know, in the area of women's leadership and understanding women's leadership and, and how I think our understanding of that field has evolved, it's so interesting for a time, you know, I'm talking about the days of lean in. Yes. Um, it was this idea, you know, and uh, this, this, this idea of, of lean in and also the rise of coaching, yeah. which there is a certain degree of coaching, which is still based on the model. I think therefore I am, mm -hmm. which PS is quite a patriarchal. I think that's Renee Descartes, uh, I believe, um, but still a very patriarchal idea that you are your thoughts or mm -hmm. that your thoughts drive everything. And to me, that is a reinforcement of a patriarchal viewpoint. And it's not 
really anchored in the feminine. Um, so I think there's room for both, you know, if you yeah. think about the feminine being, you know, sort of that divinity within <laughs> versus yes. that divinity without. Sure. So, so what, as I was sort of thinking through about your work, and I think what's so powerful about it is this idea that it is a cultural soup. And so sometimes if, when you feel less than when another mm -hmm. woman's um, successes make you somehow feel derailed, you know, yes. if you feel threatened by other extraordinary women, and there's a part of you, a very self-aware part that knows that's not healthy, that's not good. But no matter how much self-coaching you do, you still can't get past it. To me, it's the lar it's because of the culture and it's that recognition of the culture that we're all in. I have found that to be incredibly helpful, you know? Yes. And it, that's why I firmly believe, um, so with my work, I, I also shifted, I'm deal with the organizational setting or, you know, but it's, it happens to women outside of organizations. It's in families, it's in social circles, you know, it's everywhere. But I firmly believe if we talk about it, understand the root causes of why this behavior exists and just are transparent with it, um, that will help to change the lens because you have to understand what's going on. So in an organizational setting, leadership needs to talk about it, but also bottoms up like it, it, you got to talk about the elephant in the boardroom and you have to have ramifications in play that everybody understands. So, you know, you're not going to put up with it anymore mm. and get to know each other as people. I think that's a lot of it too. You're not just a worker bee, you're a person. And that helps to get to know each other a little bit more on a personal level where, you know, it's not just a colleague. Yeah. So let's talk about, um, I wanted to switch gears here yeah. and really kind of focus a little bit on your book. So behind frenemy yeah. lines is the book. Um, yes. it's available for purchase now y'all pre pre-order. It. It's, pre it's available pre for pre-order. Pre yes. Pre-order. Um, it's, um, Amazon and all other online sellers like Barnes and Noble, other big um, sellers are selling it right now. I do have, I will have more copies to sell. So, um, I can sell personally as well, but, um, yes, the book, um, listen, so the book is so, and it's just so exciting, um, you know, to have the book out and to, yes. you know, to, for women to be able to read a little bit more yes. about this and understand more about this, but I want to dive into the process of writing a book. So writing a book is a huge creative process, a huge yes. creative project, Yes. And I would love to get really tactical about how you did this because you have um, a thriving business. Yes. You were working, you know, you were uh, doing corporate contracts, working with private clients. Um, you have a life. <laughs> so, <laughs> <I tried. laughs> you, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, walk us through, like, practically speaking, you know, how long did this project take you? How did you, you know, put, carve out the time to do the book while yeah. you're making money, having that financial imperative, doing the things to keep your business going. I'm so curious about how you made that happen and how you handled that balance. I will answer this twofold. So the first part of the answer is this book has been brewing for a long time because of the mm. research I did. And after I completed my dissertation, I continued to collect stories. So yeah. 10 plus years, just with the story collecting and it was brewing in the back of my mind. What really kickstarted it, which I didn't say earlier, is when I was my last big project that I worked on, um, I experienced female rivalry and I didn't know it was occurring. And it happened for six months. And my mom brought it to my attention and said, I hate to see how you doubt yourself because of this other woman. And I had one of those light bulbs on top of my head after we spoke. I'm like, oh my God, this is female rivalry. And if I've studied it and don't know it, how is it impacting women who have not studied it? Because I lost my voice. I felt gray. I, like it was all the feelings. And so I went back through my stories and I thought, oh my God, I felt like her and I felt like her and I experienced what she did. And so that kind of, it was the best, worst thing I could have experienced. And so that also kickstarted, like, I need to write this book. Then fast forward to COVID. So COVID changed things um, time-wise, business-wise, you know, um, 
some of my clients stepped down a bit. So things got a little bit slower. And then I'm in the house with my entire family. <laughs> More time. Such joy. Such, Such joy. I love my family. <laughs> but um, I just, the time was right. And I had gone to a talk about book publishing. So I really knew the ins and outs of what was out there. And um, I thought, I'm going to write this. So I literally would write a half an hour to an hour each day. I would just you know, whenever time I could get it, I had my outline and I plugged it in. Um, so COVID helped to pivot my business. And um, along that time too, it was this time last year, I would, had gone through my notes, I was in your class. And yes. so it was a pivot at the same time, writing the book and really honing in on what my, my niche, niche is, niches. And I'm like, I'm focusing on female rivalry. I still do the consulting and coaching, but really this is what sets me apart. I mm -hmm. researched it. I'm, I understand this area and it's my area of expertise. So I outlined my plan. I worked a little bit each day, um, had a lot of time with the family, you know, and I think it helped to seeing clients virtually that lessened where I wasn't commuting. None of us were as much. Yeah. So it really was bite off a little bit each day at a time. I hired a writing coach and she helped me walk through the process to know how to publish a book. And then my book actually got picked up by a publisher. So that was hugely exciting. And I also had, um, well, the Power Presence program. That was a great network of awesome women. And then I had another coaching group I was with in we all came from different businesses, but we all were experiencing the same things with COVID. And um, so that was huge. Just, I had great women that supported me. I mean, that mm. bottom line, those groups that helped support me, like that just gave me the oomph to know that I could do this. And I'm even when I wrote my dissertation, I would write a little bit at a time. It's like you, you tear off a little bit rather than you know trying to eat the whole elephant. <laughs> talking yes. a lot about elephants today, but um, that's the whole right. elephant yeah. in one chunk. <laughs> Yeah. And that's so, and I mean, I think that idea of, of easy does it, you know, yes. of that sort of consistency and making that process your own um, and, yeah. and being really clear about what's going to work best for you. Yes. And yeah. I, I started that writing the dissertation. I always, I would always write a little bit each day and I always tried to take one day of the weekend off um, just to step away from the computer because I like it's amazing when I step away how much of those creative juices get flowing like when right. you're out walking or doing things and so that would re-energize me and I did that same approach with writing as well yeah so let's talk about you say niche I say niche let's talk know, about I'm that a little <laughs> bit right because that was yeah that was one of the core things that we looked yes. at in power yes. presence position and yes. I think it's so it's so grounding and yes. centering for a woman entrepreneur to really understand this is where I, this is my lane, you know, it's, and I think um, it's free, so, right? It's very free. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, totally. Right. Mm -hmm. And I can remember, you know, a lot of the way that niching is taught is it's yeah. all about the who you have to be super specific about the who, or you have to be. Yeah. And sometimes, um, but there's other times where it's actually, um, much more powerful to be really clear on the what. So when you have yes. a really good what, so guys, yes. you need to come <laughs> into power presence position for us to figure out where you stand. But for you, Amber, yeah. this idea of female rivalry, it was such a smoking niche, such a powerful mm -hmm. body of work. And there, there are definitely thought leaders. I, th I think about women like Brene Brown, Yes, all about the power of shame and vulnerability. That mm -hmm. was the what. Yes. you know, and yes. it could apply to a lot of different people, but I'd love for you to kind of speak a little bit about, you know, the work that we collaborated on in power presence position and how that this is the business accelerator, not the podcast, Yes, but how that, you know, how identifying the niche impacted you. It just, I looked at things for first, let's start off amazing group of women like kick-ass women that are just super cool, all different walks of life, all different types of businesses, but that same entrepreneurial mindset and wanting to better their business. And that's um, energizing and your awesome team because they are amazing. So um, 
coming into it and answering the questions and the, you know, the interviews beforehand, it's just, it's a lot about changing your mindset. And so it's, you're still looking at the bigger picture, but you're honing in on the true messaging. And so rather than me, for example, doing coaching and consulting, I'm revamping my website right now. That will still be in there just because actually right now it's my URL, but um, yeah. that's not really what I do anymore. I'm doing workshops. I'm doing presentations. I'm, I'm going out. To, there will be some consulting with organizations, but right now I'm also working, which started this time last year in your class um, is my online course. So that I hope to have launch in March for International Women's Month, and it will follow my book outline. But so it's just looking in, you would look, we look at our messaging, we were looking at the pain points were huge. And um, that really is to know how you're speaking with your audience, but to know that you're really um, connecting with them. So ways to connect with the people who are going to be drawn to the work that you do. And it was just, yeah. Yeah. And I think that idea, the feedback, yes, the right? feedback yeah. from everybody is huge. I think, especially when, you know, you had this incredible expertise in female rivalry and you knew that, you know, and yes. it was like lighting, you know, it's so clear it's lighting you up and is such an important piece of work. And so allowing that to be the focus. And then it's like that connection point, you know, yes. what would prompt a woman to know that she needs this? Yes. Right. And that's the key. If you're going to niche on the what, um, yes. which is the minority, the minority yes. of people can niche on the what it's got to be a really good, what y'all you have to have, it's got to be smoking <laughs> hot, like female rivalry, but how does that, that in and of itself is intriguing, but re really drives the money is how your, what connects, like how, how clear are you being, um, about the circumstances through which your potential buyer understands your what and understands. And I found out to her. I wasn't as clear yeah. as I needed to be. And so that was a huge thing because people know what rivalry is, but how do you explain it? You know, yes. how do you explain it where it impacts you personally, where it's not, it, when I didn't want to say it's a cat fight because I think that mm -hmm. diminishes what the true behavior is. So that was really helpful to really deep dive and come out with my, you know, couple sentence. Um, yeah. I'm totally spacing on what we call that. What did we yeah, call that? Power yeah. Yeah, power statement. Yeah, my power statement. And um, that was huge because yeah. in two sentences, I can describe what I do. And I love that because I think, you know, I think what's so key for, for people to really understand too, is that in some ways, the most damning praise is when people are hearing about your work, people who should be buying it. This is fine if it's not the people who should be buying it, yeah. but the most damning praise is, oh, that's so interesting. <laughs> it means they don't you know, really know what you're talking they about. They don't really know what you're, you haven't really, you know, versus that ability to yeah. really demonstrate, no, like this is how your business isn't growing because you're stewing in rivalry um, which is harming your creativity. It's harming your ability to form partnerships. It's harming your ability to collaborate with your team. There's no aspect of your business growth that isn't tied to this. And so we need to solve this. We need to help yes. you move through this so that you can, that is so much, you know, that for, for the right people, that's going to be a really powerful statement. Some of you who are listening to this, if I was just talking to yeah. you, well, you know, you know what book to buy and you know who to yes. get in touch with. You know who right? to get in touch with. And we will have yes. a course in the spring. <laughs> Amazing. So exciting. So exciting. So I guess we'll sort of wrap up, you know, um, is there anything, any message about female rivalry that I didn't ask you about that you'd like to share with the women who are listening? I think one thing we may not have touched on is what really you know, uh, from the, there's the external factors that feed into it. There's a lot of internal envy, jealousy, um, the need, I think it stems for some women, um, the, the need or the desire for control, the need or desire to be heard, to find her place. And what I tell so many women, I tell this to my daughter because it starts at such a young age. 
you have no control over another person's behavior and what she is projecting towards you 99% of the time has absolutely nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with her and how she's feeling inside. That can be so hard to um, digest. I know when I experienced it, I it was hard for me to digest and I had studied this, but then after I did my own therapy on this and got through it, I'm like, of course it had everything to do with her. She was not happy in her own skin and to squash other people that made her feel higher or better. So if you are experiencing this, um, try to step out of yourself to look at it objectively, to know it's her. If you've experienced it previously, try to look forward to know how you can overcome it. Because if you are still in it, it can eat you alive. So those are the main things, just um, it happens and it's awful, but when you overcome it and you know what you don't want to have in your team or your organization or your own business, that is eye-opening. And the women I've spoken to who have overcome this, what they've done to change on their teams and their own, work businesses, it's just amazing because um, it, it's made them ultimately stronger. Mm, I love that. And I think what I would add to that is it's her and it's the culture. Exactly. You know, I think that's such, yes. it's, it's her yes. in, it's her as a product of her own limitations and that we, you know, that we all have. And it's also her in the culture. And this doesn't mean you need to be best friends. No, <laughs> It doesn't mean no. it's just, it's no. so, I, it's just so helpful when you have, like you said, you know, when you have that clear picture, oh my gosh, this is happening to me. Yes. You know, I'm experiencing this and we, you know, and I think the, I guess, you know, where I'm coming from is I think there's been so much weaponizing women against each other and yeah. putting us at fault for, um, and making us accountable for a culture that, that has never you know, that has never really valued us. And I, I feel like that's such an important component of it um, as well, you know, in terms of how it's it all, it's a tangled it web. Up. We, we, Isn't it? <laughs> and Isn't it's it? not black. And, yes. It's not black yeah. and white. Like yeah. every, it's going to be different for everyone, but yeah. it certainly is there. Yeah. And I love what you said about this idea of in that tangled well, web, it is about just getting back to yourself. And, you know, like getting back to yourself, your voice, your wisdom, your intuition, trusting that and having yes. that be that whole place being your oh, starting point. I talk so much about intuition and your gut instinct. My next blog this week is all about listening to your spidey senses because mm, right? that I just read a quote, your, your instinct is your guardian angel. And I believe that like you yeah. need to listen to that. That's your whisper telling you the truth. Yeah. Well, I so appreciate you being here and sharing your wisdom with us. Guys, go out, pre-order behind frenemy lines and follow Dr. Amber Tishner. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.